we are going to consider a matter which clearly has come to world attention over the last 12 months or more. Precipitated, we might say, by the attack upon uh, Israel back in October of last year. And again, yet again, we might say, the Middle East finds itself to be the news of the world. And that news of the world comes about because of a conflict between Israel and those who have come against her. So you'll be aware of stirrings with regard to Hamas, of issues with regard to Hezbollah, of matters with, with regard to the Houthis, of Iran sending drones against Israel. It's a story of war. And you know, one of the things is that times of war bring tragedy for all involved. There's probably a true saying that in a war, nobody wins. Everyone shares in the suffering. No one is exempt from the pain. And if there's one issue which prevents a comprehensive peace in the Middle East, that issue clearly relates to the ongoing controversy between the Jews and the Arabs over the land of Palestine. Now, we need to make it clear that our, our investigation tonight is biblical. It's not political. It's not military. It's not economic. It's not sociological. It's an examination of the Bible's promise of Middle East peace. And what we want to do is to set out as clearly as possible what the Bible says on this particular matter and why in fact we've got very good reasons to believe and to have confidence that there will be a resolution and that the peace that will come to this region, as it turns out, will become the precursor to a peace, peace initiative that will bring peace to all the world. Now, this conflict began in biblical times, so I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles so that we can come back to examine some a biblical background to what we're going to follow through this evening. And we're going to start in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7. Uh, for those using the, the Bible from the back, it's page 15. And what we're told there in Genesis chapter 12, it says this in the seventh verse, maybe verse 6 for connection. Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So here's a promise made concerning the land unto Abraham, promising that he would, be, he would, he would receive it uh, in and through his seed. But you notice in the next chapter, in Genesis chapter 13, or page 16, it says, verse 14, perhaps a connection, and the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes, look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Ah, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. So now Abraham himself is involved in this particular promise. And again, if we come to Genesis chapter 18, sorry, chapter 15, we're told this in verse 18, and on page 18, the record says, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And one last passage in Genesis chapter 17, which is on page 20, it says there in verse 8 of that chapter, and I will give unto thee, says God, to Abram, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So here's a set of scriptural passages Genesis chapter 12, Genesis 13, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, that expressly point to the fact that this land was given to Abraham's seed. And you notice the key ideas in those passages as we went through them. You see, unto thy seed, unto thy seed, unto thy seed, and to thy seed. The promise was not only concerning the land, but a seed of Abraham who would be the rightful inheritor of that land. And how would all this be accomplished? Who would perform this? Who would fulfill this promise? We'll see, see what, what it says again. Verse uh, chapter 12, I will give this land, says God. 
chapter 13, all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it, says God. Genesis 15, I have given this land. Genesis chapter 17, I will give unto thee the land, all the land of Canaan. So what we learn from these passages is that God gave this land to Abraham and to his seed. That's the teaching of the Bible. But there was a problem. And the problem was that Abraham had two principal sons, both of whom could claim to be his rightful heir and the promised seed who should inherit the land. So come now to, the, to, first to, to Genesis chapter 16, uh, just back a, a chapter, which is on page 19. And the record says this concerning the first of Abraham's principal sons, says in chapter 16 and reading from verse 11, the angel of the Lord said unto her, behold, thou art with child and shall bear a son and shalt call his name Ishmael because the Lord hath heard thy affliction and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Now that word wild man in the Hebrew in which the Old Testament of the Bible was originally written, actually it's the word for a wild ass. It's a reference to the wild donkey that runs free in the wilderness and that will not accept any restraint. This was the character of the man who was called Ishmael. And we're told that he went to live in the wilderness. He became an archer, says Genesis chapter 21, verse 20. He was a man who hunted and roamed. And that same disposition was seen in the Bedouin Arab who, like Ishmael, wandered the deserts of Arabia for centuries later. And yet for all of that, says this chapter, did you notice at the end of that verse, it says that he was to dwell in the presence of or nearby to his brethren. And, and so finally it says in verse 15, and Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare Ishmael. So here's the first of two sons that, that Abraham had that might lay rightful claim to the promise of the land. Well, here's the second son in chapter 21. Come to Genesis chapter 21, which in the Bible from the back is page 26. And the record says this in Genesis 21 and reading from verse 2, and maybe verse 1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken, for Sarah conceived and bare Abram a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. Now, Isaac was a tent dweller. He was more at home with the domestic routine of flock and field than with the wandering of the range or the thrill of the chase. But his birth engendered a spirit of antagonism with Ishmael. And from this point forth, there'd be a conflict between the two boys. But God had already made choice. And God already declared what his choice was or who his choice was, because in this same chapter, Genesis 21 verse 12, the record expressly says, God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, Ishmael, and because of thy bondwoman, Hagar, in all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Oh, do you see that little phrase? Thy seed. That's the one we've seen in all those previous chapters. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, why this is significant in, in Bible history is because, you see, Ishmael was the progenitor of the Arabs. And Isaac was the progenitor of the Jews. And the question of their respective territories and of the conflict between the two over the promise made to their father by God was finally resolved at the time of Abraham's death. And that's in Genesis chapter 25 or page 33 of your Bible. In Genesis chapter 25, we're told this at the time of the death of the patriarch. It says that Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. So let's see now what's going to happen in terms of, of the treatment of the two sons 
at the time of, of Abraham's impending death. He gave all that he had unto Isaac. So part of what Isaac received was his inheritance in the land of Palestine. He remained where he was. He stayed. So Isaac ends up in the area or the territory of Palestine. And now verse 6 goes on to say, but under the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he, Abraham, yet lived eastward into the east country. So Ishmael and Keturah's sons, a later wife of Isaac, or another a wife rather of Abraham, they were sent eastward, says the record, into the great Arabian Peninsula. But they were given gifts by Abraham, which would have included, incidentally, their own flocks and herds. Sent them, He sent them to find their own lands, their own pastures, to build their own lives and families and futures in the lands adjoining Palestine. So that's where Ishmael went. He went to the east, into the eastward country, which is the beginning, the top there, of the Arabian Peninsula. And it was after this that Abraham died. And do you see what it says in Genesis 25, right here, verse nine. And his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah. Or did you notice the order of the boys now? His sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Notice that order. Isaac comes first now. They came together to bury their father in the cave of Machpelah. And the wilderness of Arabia, where the other sons moved eastward, was in ancient times divided into three sections. So just expanding that, that desert of Arabia part, the Arabian Peninsula, as it's come to be known, the three key areas of that peninsula there was Arabia deserter to the northeast, which was inhabited principally by Kedar. There was Arabia Petria to the northwest, which was inhabited by Midian. And there was Arabia Felix to the southeast, which was inhabited by Sheba. Now, the Arabs have expanded beyond this peninsula since those biblical times. But here's the point. That peninsula was the cradle of the civilization of the Arabs. And it remains the heartland of the Arab people. This is where, apparently, Muhammad would arise. This is where, apparently, the holiest shrine of the Muslim faith is still to be found. In fact, the record says in verse 18, concerning Ishmael and his descendants, verse 18, they dwelt from Havilah unto Shur, that is before Egypt, as thou goest towards Assyria, and he died in the presence of all his brethren. Now, from Havilah to Shur stretches along the whole of that southern coast. So right here, from the south at the, at the, at the bottom, right to the north, along that coastline is Havilah to Shur. And that's where these descendants of Abraham went. In fact, you see what it says in that verse, at the end of the verse, it, it perhaps is not always read carefully enough, he died in the presence of his brethren. But the margin says, he fell. And it would appear that the lot refers to, the word refers to the lot of his inheritance. That this is where his inheritance fell. This is where Ishmael's territory fell. So this is where Ishmael settled. He went to the east of Palestine. Now today, that Arabian Peninsula is where the Arab nations of Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Dubai, Kuwait, Iraq are all to be found. It's still full of Arabs, which really is indicative of the fact that what we're told about in Genesis 25 here is exactly what did happen because the Arabs have filled that place ever since. They did go eastward. Now, before leaving Genesis 25, we should take note of the descendants of Abraham who are listed here in this chapter. Do, do you notice in verse 16, concerning Ishmael himself, it says this. Let me just put that on screen. So Abraham and through Hagar, Ishmael. So verse 16 says, these are the sons of Ishmael and these are their names by their towns, by their castles, 12 princes according to their nations. 
And these are the years of the life of Ishmael. And 130 and seven years, he gave up the spirit and died and was gathered unto his people. And, and that list, as is given to us in this chapter, is these. So Nebaioth, Kedah, Abdel, all these 12 princes, as listed in Genesis 25, are the sons of Ishmael who will receive a territory dwelling from Havilah to Shur. But then we've got a second line, because coming back to verse 1, it says, Then again Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah, and she bare him Zimran and Joksan and Medan and Midian. We've got another whole list. So let me just put that list on the screen through Keturah. So we've got these sons, one, two, three, four, five, six of them. And then out of Jokshan, we've got Sheba and Dedan. And out of and below them, we've got Ashurim and Latushim and Leumim. And then we've also got the sons of Midian, uh, Ephah, Ephah, Hanak, Ebedah, and Eldeah. So now we've got all of these tribes descended from either Hagar or Keturah, and they all intermixed and intermingled through time. But they're all the offspring of Abraham through these two wives. Now, we've highlighted on the screen there Kedar and Midian, and Sheba, because we've already seen how these tribes were based in the three key regions of the Arabian Peninsula. Kedah in Arabia Deserta, Midian in Arabia Petria, and Sheba in Arabia Felix. Now of all those tribes, one became the most prominent and the most famous. And that tribe was Kedar. If you come with me to the book of Ezekiel, the prophecy of Ezekiel, much later on in the Old Testament record, it's on page 1235, and we're told this concerning the tribe of Kedar, one of the descendants of Abraham. We're told this in Ezekiel 27, reading verse 21. It says, Arabia... And all the princes of Kedar, they occupied with thee, and lambs and rams and goats, and these were they thy merchants. So do you notice how the word Kedar here is used almost as a proxy term for Arabia as a whole, and for the Arabians as a whole? Now, in Hebrew, the name Kedar means dusky, but in Arabic, the name Kedar means powerful. And that's what they were. They became influential over many centuries because their dominance of the con control of the spice routes of that greater Arabian peninsula made them a key power in the region. Here's an interesting extract from Smith's Bible Dictionary, a very old Bible Dictionary, but a very comprehensive one. And it says this concerning Kedar. It says, Kedar, the second son of Ishmael, and the name of a great tribe of the Arabs settled on the northwest of the peninsula. And, notice, just on the confines of Palestine. That's interesting, isn't it? Just on the confines of where Isaac was dwelling. Kedah was a far-stretching tribe, penetrating into the Arabian peninsula. The archers and warriors of the tribe were engaged in many of the wars which the men of the east waged with Israel. Kedar was an ancestor of Muhammad. Through him, the ancestry from Ishmael is carried. And then it says, this tribe seems to have been one of the most conspicuous of all the Ishmaelite tribes, and hence the rabbins call the Arabians universally by this name, Kedar. So Kedar was a powerful tribe, a military tribe, and it was noted for its hostility to Israel. But despite that opposition, the Jewish people were settled in Palestine for centuries. They lived in the land under Jewish judges for over 300 years before a sovereign Jewish state was formed with a Jewish king, around about BC 1020. And that national presence of Israel continued until the Romans forcibly expelled the Jews in AD 135 and renamed the area Palestine. But by that time, by the time the Romans did that, the Jews had been there for over 1,400 years. So when we come to the return of the Jewish people in recent times, they are not settler colonialists. 
They are the indigenous people of the land. They speak the same language the Jews spoke in their national state of Israel 2,000 years ago. They practice the same customs the Jews practiced in their national state of Israel 2,000 years ago. They read the same holy scriptures the Jews read in their national state of Israel 2,000 years ago. They're the indigenous people of the land. And their very return was a miracle of Bible prophecy from the very scriptures that they had read, because this is what their own Hebrew Old Testament had said on the matter of the return of the Jews. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 3 and 5, The Lord thy God will return and gather thee from the nations and will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed. Jeremiah 30, verse 3, I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, and I will cause them to return to the land I gave to their fathers. Ezekiel 34, verse 33, I will gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel. Ezekiel 37, verses 21 and 22, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen and will bring them into their own land upon the mountains of Israel. They're indigenous to this land. The Jewish nation is the only sovereign state that has ever existed in the territory of Palestine. The only sovereign state that's ever existed is a Jewish one. But their return has been marked by the same hostility of biblical times. They've had to fight for their existence over and over again. You know, the reality is that in the Middle East right now, there are two fundamentally different attitudes at work in the place, in the drama. Let me show you the um, Independence Declaration of Israel that dates to 1948. This is just some of the language out of the Declaration of Independence with which Israel began its existence. The state of Israel will be based on freedom, justice, and peace as envisaged by the prophets of Israel. It will guarantee freedom of religion, conscience, language, education, and culture. It will safeguard the holy places of all religions. We appeal to the Arab inhabitants of the state of Israel to preserve peace and to participate in the upbuilding of the state on the basis of full and equal citizenship. We extend our hand to all neighboring states and their peoples in an offer of peace and good neighborliness and appeal to them to establish bonds of cooperation and mutual help with the sovereign Jewish people. Here's the Palestinian National Charter from 20 years later in 1968. I just want you to notice the change of tone, the different approach. Article nine, the Palestinian Arab people assert their absolute determination and resolution to work for an armed popular revolution for the liberation of their country and their return to it. Article 15, it is a national duty to repel the Zionist and imperialist aggression against the Arab homeland and aims at the elimination of Zionism in Palestine. Article 22, Israel is a constant threat vis-a-vis -vis peace in the Middle East and the whole world. The liberation of Palestine will destroy the Zionist and imperialist presence and will contribute to the establishment of peace in the Middle East. Peace by destruction is always the best sort of peace, don't you think? Peace by extermination, the most comprehensive form of peace? Can you sense the antagonism? Can you feel the difference between the two charters? 1968, how about 1988, the Hamas Covenant? Israel will exist and will continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it just as it obliterated others before it. The day of judgment will not come about until Muslims fight the Jews, killing the Jews, when the Jews will hide behind stones and trees, and the stones and trees will say, oh Muslims, oh Abdullah, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. That's the charter. 
It was revised in 2017, a much more moderate document. Hamas rejects any alternative to the full and complete liberation of Palestine from the river to the sea, which really means extermination of all Jews. Come to Psalm 120, because this spirit, notable in these charters, was known of old. The Bible talks about the spirit. Page 893 in your Bible, Psalm 120 in verse 5, is what the record says. The psalmist of old said in Psalm 120 verse 5, Woe is me, he says, that I sojourn in Meshach, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. So the psalmist lamented that he felt surrounded by those who were at enmity with him. And he used the names of two of Israel's greatest adversaries to describe how he felt. So what was it like to sojourn in Meshach and dwell amidst Kedar? Well, verses six and seven tell us, my soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace. But when I speak, they are for war. And when you look at the Middle East today, I think we would suggest that the situation has not changed one bit since biblical times and since the writing of this psalm. The spirit of ancient Kedar is alive and well in Hamas in modern times and Hezbollah and the Houthis and perhaps especially Iran. In 1937, a separate Palestinian state was proposed. The Jews accepted. The Arabs refused. In 1947, a separate Palestinian state was proposed. The Jews accepted. The Arabs refused. In 1967, after the Six-Day War, the Arab world met and released the infamous Khartoum resolutions. No peace with Israel, no negotiation with Israel, no recognition of Israel. In 2000, a separate Palestinian state was offered. The Jews proposed. The Arabs refused. In 2008, a separate Palestinian state was offered. The Jews proposed. The Arabs refused. They don't want a separate Palestinian state. Not if it means the existence of a separate Jewish state. The truth is, the Arabs won't accept a two-state solution at all. Their only position is one state covering every square inch of Palestine, belonging exclusively to the Arabs, with not a Jew in sight, because they've all been exterminated. That's what from the river to the sea means. So based on the history of the last 70 years, the real question is not do the Palestinians want a sovereign state, but will they, as the prerequisite for that, recognize the reality of a Jewish state? Now that situation, we suggest, is humanly impossible to resolve. All people will point the finger at both sides for various wrongs that have been committed and in times of war that's undoubtedly what happens. But for all of that, for all of the wrong that people throw and accusations on either side, this is what the Bible says about the descendants of Isaac. Genesis, I will curse him that curseth thee. Isaiah, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Jeremiah, strangers shall no more serve themselves of thee. Isaiah again, when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Ezekiel, they shall be no more a prey to the heathen. Amos, they shall not be pulled up out of their land. In endeavouring to destroy Israel, Hamas and all others are fighting against destiny because Palestine's already been promised by God in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So Hamas won't give up and Israel won't give in. So this is not going to be solved by the Jews and Arabs of today. There are too many intractable differences. There are too many irreconcilable problems. The only, the only solution is some form of external intervention. Something's got to happen to break the stalemate. And I think that the Bible identifies the very moment when that change will occur. Because you see, the Bible speaks of the coming of Christ to establish a worldwide kingdom that just happens to be centered in Israel. 
And we believe that the drama of that event, the return of Christ, is what's needed to set in motion the promise and the prospect of peace in the Middle East. Now, there are many scriptures that deal with the advent of Christ and the things that will unfold as a result of his return. But we're just going to refer to a couple of, of scriptures to, to follow through the balance of the story that we've been following from Genesis onwards. So come with me, if you would, please, to uh, Isaiah chapter 21. Page 1009 in your Bible, and reading from Isaiah 21 and verse 14. Again, verse 13 for connection. The burden upon Arabia. Ah, so we're in the Arabian Peninsula. In the forest in Arabia shall ye lodge, O ye travelling companies of Dedanim. The inhabitants of the land of Timar brought water to him that was thirsty. They prevented with their bread him that fled. Now, Timar was in the Arabian Peninsula, right next to the Dedanim mentioned in that 13th verse. But what's interesting about verse 14 is that in the Hebrew, the words are in what's called the imperative tense. In other words, they're to be read as an order. So the New American Standard Bible says, bring water for the thirsty, you inhabitants of the land of Timar. Go and meet the fugitives with bread. So here is an instruction from someone to the Arabs, that they should bring water and bread. And if we were to ask, well, what's that about and, and, and why are they fleeing, these ones that fled in verse 14, the answer says in verse 15, for they fled from the swords, from the jawed sword, from the bent bow, from the grievousness of war. And we suggest that the, those that will flee in this verse are the Jewish people who will be fleeing from an invasion of their land, which the Bible does talk about. A Bible, a Bible invasion that's spoken of at length in other prophecies. But what this chapter is telling us is where do they flee to for succor? Where do they go to for support? Well, to their Arab neighbours that lie to the east. And in the providence of God, these places will provide a haven for Jewish refugees because their territories immediately to the east of Israel are going to be miraculously spared from that invasion precisely so they can offer the assistance spoken of here in these verses. And then verse 16 goes on to say, For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Within a year, according to the years of an hireling, and all the glory of Kedar shall fail. Now that verse can't refer to the final overthrow of Kedar within a year of Isaiah's words. And we know that because the prophet Jeremiah will give another oracle concerning Kedar a hundred years after this one. And they're still in existence. Jeremiah 49 verse 28 says, Arise, ye go up to Kedar, spoil the men of the east. And that prophecy was fulfilled by Nebuchadnezzar in BC 599 when he overthrew the Kedarites in this area. So the final fulfillment of Isaiah's words are yet to come. So what's the glory of Kedar, do you think, that might fail? The glory of Kedar, what is it? Well, verse 17 tells us, The residue of the number of archers... The mighty men of the children of Kedar shall be diminished. So the brooding, warlike spirit of Kedar is to be brought to nothing. Do you know, from the days of Ishmael, they were archers. They used bow and arrow to war their warfare. And I suggest to you that in a sense, nothing has changed. The spirit of Kedar is now seen in the work of Hamas, which have fired tens of thousands of rockets from Gaza into Israel. The Qassar missiles are their modern day arrows, the biggest ones they can find. And they've been firing them indiscriminately at civilian populations in Israel day in, day out for over 15 years. Do you know that even Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas said, there is no justification for launching rockets from Gaza or anywhere else, he said. Rocket attacks are useless because they keep the peace away. But then that's precisely why Hamas continue to fire them. You see, their intention is to prevent peace from ever being possible. 
And this latest attack last October came at the very time that the Abraham Accords were going to be extended from the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain to consider the inclusion of Saudi Arabia. And on the eve of that event, Hamas blew up the peace process just as they've done before. Well, this is all going to stop, says the Bible. The arches of Kedar are going to be removed. And the proof? We'll see how the verse ends. Because the mouth of the Lord God of Israel hath spoken it. And that edict, we suggest, is going to be uttered by the Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of God when he returns. An edict that will be part of a radical change throughout the Arab world. So here it is here, Isaiah 21, the glory of Kedar shall fail because there'll be an order that comes, we believe, from Christ to do so. And that's not the only passage like it. Look at this one in Habakkuk chapter 3. He stood and measured the earth. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Or what about this one in Psalm 72? Before him let the men of the desert bow and his enemies shall lick the dust and the kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. So who's the man who issues the command for assistance in Isaiah 21? Who's the man who stands and measures the earth in Habakkuk chapter 3? Who's the man before whom the men of the desert shall bow in Psalm 72? We suggest that that's the Lord Jesus Christ returned to the earth to assume the position of rulership that God's marked out for him. Now, we've met these names before, Kedar, Midian, Sheba. These are the names of some of the greatest of the Arabian tribes of the Arabian Peninsula. And this is the moment, we believe, when they'll all come into contact with the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are bigger objectives at work here, because these verses are part of the work of Christ to establish a comprehensive peace accord throughout the whole of the Middle East. And I think the Bible maps out how it will be done. That Christ will arrive with a peace plan for the Middle East. And here's how I think the Bible suggests that he'll achieve it. See, what he's got to do is deal with both sides of the ledger, as it were. So the Bible promises that the Jews will be humbled, that Israel will be humbled. And the Bible promises that Arabia will be humbled. And the Bible says that Israel will be converted. And the Bible teaches that Arabia will be converted. And the Bible suggests that Israel will be blessed. And the Bible promises that Arabia will be blessed. And the Bible says that Israel will finally be exalted. And the Bible says that finally Arabia will be exalted. So what we have is a Jewish-Arab peace accord brought forth by the Lord Jesus Christ to deal with both sides. So here's the question, of course. How might we imagine that Christ could actually accomplish that? How could Christ possibly have the ability to bring about this change? Well, I think there are several special reasons. The first relates to the power that he will hold. Matthew 28 verse 18 says of the Lord, Jesus spake saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And Christ will have control of the forces of nature. So at the Lord's word, he will be able to summon a furious cyclone or launch a savage storm. At his command, he'll be able to ignite a raging fire or unleash an earthquake. No one can fight against such power. No one can defeat such a person. If during his mortal life, men said in astonishment, what manner of man is this that even the winds and waves obey him, just wait until he reveals the vast powers that have been bestowed upon him by God. He'll have power beyond what we could ever imagine, and he'll be ready to use it. So that's one good reason why he will achieve what no one else has. And I think the second reason relates to the authority that Christ will possess. Because in the question of the Jewish-Arab controversy, this is the one man that can reach both sides and call them to order. You see, to the Arabs, Christ will prove by great wonders that he is the prophet greater than Muhammad, to whom they must submit. 
Ask of him any miracle and he'll be able to perform it. Even the Hamas covenant, which aims at exterminating Jews, has this in its charter. Palestine is the birthplace of Jesus Christ. Peace be upon him. This is the one man that the Arabs will listen to because they're expecting him to return. Even the Shiite Muslims call him Messiah and they're waiting for him. So part of the work of Christ will be to call upon the Arab world to submit to his authority and accept his judgment on the question of Palestine. And to the Jews, Christ will prove by mighty signs that he's the prophet greater than Moses, to whom they must hearken. Ask of him any sign, and he'll be able to prove that he's the son of Abraham and the son of David, and therefore their promised Messiah, the one they pray for and yearn to see. And the work of Christ with the Jewish people will be to call upon them to submit to his rule and accept his kingship, a kingship which will be based in Jerusalem <coughs> over the territory of Palestine. This is the only man that can bring peace to the Middle East. And that'll be his very mission when he returns. And he'll have with him one associate that will put the matter beyond doubt, that both Jew and Arab will bow before him in complete obedience because it was Christ himself that said this in Luke 13, verse 28, ye shall see, he says, Abraham in the kingdom of God. He'll be there with Christ, Father Abraham. And faced with that reality, there will be an end to the hostilities between two peoples who trace their common descent from the patriarch. Christ will be there, Abraham will turn up, and he'll say to his two boys, it's time you stopped. And he'll call those boys to order, and faced with their father, they'll hasten to comply. What a day of reckoning that will be. But just look at the results of that peace accord, which Christ will achieve between the offspring of Isaac and the descendants of Ishmael. It brings us to our reading, which was Psalm 60. Not Psalm 60, Isaiah 60. And page 1070 in your Bible. So this is what it says. Here's our last passage for our consideration this evening. Isaiah 60 verse 1 says, Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. Now who's the prophet talking about? Who's the thy and the thee of this opening verse? Well, we're told in verse 14, if you're not sure, verse 14 makes it clear. The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despised thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall call thee, the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. <coughs> this prophecy in this chapter is about the future exaltation of the nation of Israel. And it describes a time when kings and peoples from all over the world will come to Israel and to Jerusalem to worship in that place. But now look at who will be there, right there, side by side with Israel in that future place of worship. Verses 6 and 7. The multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. All they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring golden incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Now, every name in these two verses is the name of an Arab tribe. The very names we saw in Genesis chapter 25. And what we're being told is that in the future there'll be a temple in Jerusalem, the house of my glory, but it will be described elsewhere as a house of prayer for all people. It'll be a center for international worship. But the Arab world will be fully involved in supporting that worship. Muslims already believe in Adam, in Abraham, in Moses, and David, in Christ himself. And it will be Christ's work to teach them the true basis of worship so they might come and participate there's going to be a religious solution to the Jewish-Arab problem. And you know that if you look more carefully at these two verses, you'll find that the names in verse 6 
uh, Arab nations descended from Abram through Keturah, while the names in verse 7 are uh, Arab nations descended from Abraham through Hagar. They're all working in close cooperation with the Jews of Israel, including Kedar. <coughs> well, how absolutely remarkable that that should be the case. You know, this male of old, had it been spoken, he shall be a wild man, yet he shall dwell in the presence of his brethren. Now, those words were a prophecy that the Arab would, would occupy the territory east of Palestine. But with one dramatic change in the future, they'll occupy that same territory. But the Bible says that the wilderness will blossom as the rose, and those eastern lands, at the word of Christ, will be made amazingly fertile. The same power that would permit the Lord to unleash destructive forces will also enable him to unlock the finest blessings of nature's gifts. So where does that lead us to? Well, it brings us to what the Bible has said all along, that there will be a king and that that king will establish peace. Psalm 72, Isaiah 9, Ezekiel 37, Zechariah 9, a king who speaks peace. In fact, see that last passage, quite interesting really. Thy king cometh unto thee, and he shall speak peace, says the record. He shall speak peace unto the, unto the nations, the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea to sea. Because you see, well, the king of Israel, who's called the Jew and Arab together, he will speak peace to the nations. If he can bring peace to the Middle East, then I can assure you that he can bring peace to anywhere in the world. And the Bible's promises that he will. What starts in the Middle East will be the precursor to an international rapport. And when a man of this power and a man of this authority comes, the pathway to peace will finally be possible. Of course, it all depends, doesn't it, on the return of Christ. So, so how can we be sure that the Lord will come? Well, I think we can be sure because of the very passages that we've already looked at in this lecture earlier about the return of the Jews to the land. Jeremiah 3, I'll bring again their captivity. Ezekiel 34, I'll gather them and bring them. Ezekiel 37, I'll gather them and bring them. Hosea 3, they shall return. Now, you see, what we've got here is, oh, do you notice that? They're not just gathered. They're not just returned. But there'll be a leader over them, says the record. And the leader is one described as David or David their king. These are the promise of a coming king. So the question is, who's the David of these passages concerning the return of the Jewish people? Who's the David that will be their king? Well, David was the greatest ruler that Israel ever had. And his reign was a type of the future reign of their Messiah king. David's name means the beloved. And when Jesus Christ was baptized, a voice from heaven said, this is my son, the beloved. We suggest that the David of the age to come is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, let me show you that in Old Testament passages. Do you know the very, the very beginning of the New Testament begins with the words, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Luke chapter 1. Jesus shall be great, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Acts chapter 13, he raised unto them David, their king, of this man's seed, has God raised Jesus. Revelation 22, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto these things, because I am the root and the offspring of David. You see, the David of the kingdom age is Jesus Christ. Now, let me take you back to those Old Testament promises. Here they are again. And just notice what they say. I'll bring again the captivity. I'll cause them to return. And they shall serve David their king. I'll gather my, my servant David. I'll gather them, my servant David. They shall return, my servant David. So what it says is this. You see, Jesus is going to take the throne when he returns. He's the David of this time. But it's linked to the return of the Jews back to their land. Now, we've seen that. You and I have seen that in our lifetimes. We've seen the Jews gathered in. We've seen them coming back from their captivity. We've seen them being returned. That much of these prophecies has already occurred. 
So why wouldn't we also expect to see the king appear promised in these same verses when half the verse has already happened? We can be certain, you see, about his return because it's linked to the truth of the Jews returning to the land of promise. And that return we've already seen. So if we can be certain about his return, then we could also be confident in what the Bible says about what he'll do when he does return. The Bible's promise of Middle East peace is a promise of comfort and hope. Hope for a future that will bring peace to a region of the world that's been so torn by conflict and despair, but comfort also for the promise of a peace that will then spread to all the earth. May he soon come that that time of peace might soon begin.